Okay, welcome back to members of 121 Community Church in Gravon, Texas, in our ongoing study in the Church Dogmatics by Karl Barth. We're looking at Part 4, the Doctrine of Reconciliation. We are in the final volume of the study edition, Volume 30, which deals with uh, paragraphs 74 and 75, the foundation of the Christian life. We've looked at the introductory comments on baptism, so we have the general framework down. Now we look at the in-depth study, and the first uh, issue that Bart wants to address is the basis of Christian baptism. What is the basis of Christian baptism? And for Professor Bart, it is the baptism of Christ by John the Baptist in the River Jordan. So let's begin by taking a look at Block 1. Now in Block 1, we've got uh, the basis of conversion through spirit baptism. And there are uh, six aspects of this concrete form of the new life. Water baptism is divinely normative and divinely authoritative for Christianity. Jesus utters the baptismal command in Matthew. He gives the injunction to baptize. It's set alongside with the command to teach. It is equally as important as teaching. It's abbreviated under Christ's missionary command. It's to be performed in a specific way in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Therefore, baptism and teaching are enclosed in the promise of the presence of Jesus Christ in the Christian life. But this new... Uh, inaugural form is enjoined by a baptism which is already affected. Bart says that this baptism in Christianity is already affected and he gives eight aspects. Uh, it was affected in Christ's baptism in the Jordan. The baptism of Christ is the basis of Christian baptism. It's the beginning of the uh, messianic office of Christ and that messianic office will close on the crucifixion at Golgotha. So the baptism in the Jordan is the prologue to the entire history of Christ. And that's the way that Bart likes to look at it. He likes to look at it as the uh, prologue to the entire history, the entire salvation or efficacious history of Christ. It establishes a definite direction. It establishes a specific goal of salvation. And key for Bart is that the uh, the intersection point or the apex of divine change is this event where spirit baptism meets water baptism in Christ. The intersecting apex of spirit baptism meeting water baptism in the baptism of Jesus Christ. And it does establish Christ as the subject of God's salvation history. Christ is designated the minister of spirit baptism. So that takes us on to note three here, the uh, conclusive note. The New Life Act and the fact that it is already affected both lead to Christian baptism as a normative command. Christian baptism is a normative and authoritative command. And he begins, Bart begins by summarizing the three aspects of Jordan baptism. It placed... Uh, Jesus placed himself under the lordship of the Father here. He also placed himself in fellowship with humanity and the judgment against humanity. And he placed himself in the service of God as the mediator and the savior, savior of all creation. So water baptism opened the history of Jesus Christ to his messianic office and his messianic purpose. And believers attest to Christ's solidarity by submitting to this baptism. And Bart also wants to point out that in Luke, the preaching of the gospel is dated from the preaching of John the Baptist. The kingdom is opened here. The interlocking of John and Christ is strongly pronounced in Scripture. And so that moves us to our first inserted structural triad or theoretical triad about the basis of baptism. And number one, it is a missionary command. 
It always promises us that uh, Christ will always be present in the Christian life and the Christian kingdom. The Jordan baptism is where spirit baptism met water baptism in Christ. The only instance where that could happen. And so the messianic purpose of baptism is inaugurated as Christ enters into solidarity with all of sinful humanity. This baptism in repentance is where Christ enters in to identity with humanity and taking up that role of son of man as his ministry. So we got our theoretical first inserted, inserted triad, and now we can move on to the concrete. When we move into the concrete in block two, we're going to look at the, the baptism already re effected <clears throat> becoming concrete in the proclamation of John the Baptist. And Bart gives a great deal of attention to the proclamation of John the Baptist because his baptism was preparation for an imminent act of God that was coming. And he gives us uh, the aspects of this uh, imminent event. The kingdom of heaven is said to take place at any moment. It will be a breaking in of God's judgment. There will also be the coming of something different. It will also be the inauguration of remission of sins. John is the preacher of righteousness in bringing this knowledge. He even gives the publicans and soldiers special instruction for what this means for them. And his message is to be perceived as both judgment and jubilation. It is judgment, but it is also grace, so it is judgment and jubilation. And all flesh will see God's salvation, which is inaugurated in this event. And Jesus, the key element is that Jesus himself submits to this coming act of God. That's the key point that Bart wants to point out, is that in this act of obedience on the part of Christ to take up the baptism of repentance... We have this uh, submission and obedience to the coming act of God. So note too, we have the imminent act of God also requiring a response of subordination. The new man is needed in response, in mind, in thought, and in aspiration. The individual is to uh, repent as a conversion. And the Greek word for repentance is metanoia. It means to orient one's life toward God. The orientation to God's will is demanded. And uh, interpretation of the self's practical life is necessitated. It is to be an interpenetration of conversion all the way down to the practical. But this conversion is required for the forgiveness of sins. And one must accept God's judgment as justified. So ultimately, repentance means to be directed to God's demonstration of grace in Christ. John's baptism simply confirms the candidate that they are looking forward to forgiveness through, through this baptism of repentance. And so our summary statement in three, we've got the imminent act of God proclaimed by John and they demanded a response of repentance and subordination, both lead to the uh, manifestation of the glory of God in Christ. By Jesus submitting to this baptism and obedience, he affirms the God who remits sins. In this act, Jesus was also confessing the humanity who are taken up in this remission so he takes up a role of obedience to God and representation of sinful humanity. He affirms his solidarity with a, a true belonging to all sinful humanity. Christ is the brother to us from all eternity, according to Hebrews. And so as Christ with us in this event, he looks forward to the establishment of the kingdom, the threatened judgment, the promised remission of sins, the obedience and conversion, and the confession of sins for us as our advocate. And that gives us our second inserted practical or concrete triad. <clears throat>
which consists of uh, John's baptism as preparation for the imminent act of God. That was the key to this baptism of repentance. It was to prepare for the imminent act of God in Christ. It was a response of subordination. Uh, it was uh, the candidate's desire to orient their life toward God. And this was to lead to the glorification of God and his goodness through Christ's solidarity with us in his taking up of his messianic office by submitting, submitting in obedience to this baptism of repentance which Christ did not need for himself, but he did as son of man for all of sinful humanity, he is seeking to glorify God and to lift humanity into unification with God's self through his obedience in John's baptism. And that takes us on to block three. Now in block three we look at... Uh, the Messianic office of Christ is being confirmed in John's baptism. In the Jordan, baptism Christ offers his definitive commitment to all of humanity, his subjection to the Father. His uh, Messianic office is confirmed in the baptism. It includes Christ's unconditional confession and unconditional solidarity with all of humanity. In the Jordan baptism, Christ is presented he presents himself in a self-proclamation as mediator between God and man. The kingdom, judgment, and forgiveness all take place in the history of Christ. And John is the prophet of the highest in Luke. He goes before the Lord. He proclaims Christ as the, uh, the strong and the dependable one, the iscure teras, the strong and the dependable one in Mark. John's preaching is the beginning of the gospel of Christ. John proclaimed Christ as already present but unrecognized. Already present but unrecognized. From here, let's take a look at uh, note two. The anticipation of the dependable one in Christ leads to the execution of God's imminent act. Where uh, Christ becomes Israel's judge. Christ becomes the Deliverer. Christ becomes the Messiah. He was appointed to minister in God's place. Christ took upon himself the baptism of repentance for all of sinful humanity. He submitted himself to the promise of forgiveness of sins and all the Kayasune righteousness would be fulfilled in the history of Christ. The Jordan baptism became the crowning event of God himself in inaugurating this messianic history. That's key for Bart. The Jordan baptism is the inaugural crowning event of God himself because it is that convergence of Father, Son, and Spirit. It is the crowning event of God himself in his salvation history. So the anticipation and the execution lead to the divine crowning event. And we learn that heaven immediately opened in the baptism of Christ. It can only be described mythologically, says Bart, but the description conveyed that in this event is constituted a confirmation of Christ's mission as the divine mission of salvation. It's confirmation of the divinity of Christ's mission. It is declared by the Father as a matter of right. It is executed by the Son as a matter of fact. It's the uh, place where the ascension of Christ coming out of the water is met with the descending, visible descension of the Spirit. And so we have uh, that uh, crowning event in the baptism as a mythological description, says Bart. He calls it a mythological description because he says that's the only language that could be used to try to capture this divine event that included the uh, declaration of the Father and the uh, execution of the Son in the uh, opening of heaven and the descending of the Spirit into the inauguration of the Messianic office of Christ. This is the confirmed Messianic office of Christ 
this confirmation could only be described in a mythological language, says Bart. It was that transcendent. It was that powerful. It was only an event that could be described mythologically because of its power, because of its transcendence. But it did, uh, it was a declaration by the Father. It was uh, an execution by the Son. It was an opening of heaven and the descension of the Spirit and the inauguration of the Messianic office of Christ, which is the foundation of Christian baptism. It is the basis of Christian baptism. This lesson is the in-depth teaching on the preaching and the uh, prophetic office of John the Baptist and just how significant that is where John functions as a signifier and a sign of he who points to Christ as the mediator, as he who points to Christ as the Messiah, and as he who points and confirms Christ as the bearer of the messianic salvation to all of humanity. So it's a great, powerful, um, in-depth lesson. We finished up that uh, introductory lesson, and this is our first in-depth lesson, but it gave us, uh, in just a few pages, 47 to 65, it gave us the basis of Christian baptism, a basis uh, in a powerful water baptism of Christ that met the Spirit. It's the only baptism where Spirit baptism met water baptism. It could only occur in one person and one person only, that being Jesus Christ. Never to be repeated, a once-for-all event where water baptism met spirit baptism. They actually intersected in this historical moment of salvation history. A profound apex, a profound life-altering apex, a divine alteration of reality a divine promise of forgiveness of sins. Tremendous teaching, tremendous uh, teaching on the basis of Christian baptism. We will pick up next time at um, page 66.